Sable Island is a crescent-shaped sand body situated about 150 kilometers off the coast of Nova Scotia. The unique property of this island is that it, it is a sand body, but it has no land connection. And the, the entire bank area where this island is situated is surrounded by water depths of two to 300 meters. And therefore, the origin of the island is somewhat in doubt. Dalhousie's interest in this island has been from the point of view of locating former sea levels. Uh, the island has a unique characteristic, which is it provides us, it can provide us with a continuous record of sea level rise on the outer part of the continental shelf. Very few areas in the world can provide us with that kind of record because they've always been submerged under fairly deep water and they provide us with no accurate indicators of sea level. But Sable Island is a platform which has actually been a grading as sea level rose and it provides us with fixed points in time that we can relate to a former sea level and therefore get a continuous record of sea level comparable with the records that we obtain from onshore areas. The island is situated between two, two oceanic currents going in opposite directions. The Labrador current, a cold current coming from the northeast, and the Gulf Stream, a warm current coming from the southwest. Additionally, there's a circular current generated around the island caused by tidal effects and this circular current is probably responsible for the island being able to keep up with rising sea level. First historical records of the island show that, first of all, in 1766, Lake Wallace was a lagoon open to the sea, and ships could actually sail into here and anchor. By 1899, the opening was closed off, and we had a, just a saltwater lake with no opening to the ocean. By 1955, the lake is much smaller and the island is distended off to the east. And then since 1955, the island has changed relatively little except that Wallace Lake has shrunk. But in the last two years, there's been one and a half kilometers of sand, exposed sand, added on to the west end of the island. In historical times, the island appears to be moving eastward. But on closer examination, we can see that the center of the island, or the center of the crescent, really hasn't moved in the last 200 years. The ends of the island, on the other hand, move constantly with changing storms. And it's even possible to see large movements of sand overnight. It's fairly easy to track the movement of the island in historical times using the old maps. But it's much more difficult in prehistoric times to pin down the actual events and how they've occurred. Although there's been a lot of oil wells drilled on the island, remarkably little is known about the upper 100 meters of the last several thousand years of geologic history. To tackle this problem, Dalhousie has embarked on a program of shallow drilling on the island, concentrating on the upper 30 meters. We have utilized an instrument called the Wink Vibracore to help us obtain relatively undisturbed samples in the upper 30 meters. What we have here is the Vibracore head. You've already seen this apart on film. And basically what happens is the cable hooks into this end here and it rotates. And inside is a small hammer-like thing which rotates inside here and it creates vibrations in this head at 12,000 times a minute. And when this head is hooked onto a, to a pipe, a drill pipe, it just vibrates itself into the ground. Now the problem we had with this particular unit at the moment is that the connection here, this piece of pipe, snapped off after only two days of usage. That being because the threads weren't quite thick enough. But these threads are used in other, other standard drill units and it tells you something about the force of this vibracore and the, and the force of these vibrations and what it does to a pipe and why, why this thing works, why it'll actually vibrate a pipe into the ground the fact that it can actually just snap a piece of drill steel like this so easily. Now the thing that, that makes this unit work, we're able to send that tube into the ground, it fills up with sand, stops, and we're able to send what we call the baler core down to clean out the hole, to keep that tube open. How this baler core works is a small flapper valve, which when the unit goes down, that flapper comes up like this, allows sand to come in. When you pull the tube up, the flapper valve shuts, 
and holds the sand in there. The key to this unit is the small recess. The valve is recessed away from the side of the uh, core tube so that the sand can't jam that, that valve and jam it open or jam it shut. And also the fact that instead of a hinge, we have a piece of leather which can't get jammed up with sand. And when it goes, it sounds like this, just sort of flapping. You can actually hear this even 100 feet under the ground. You can hear it all the way up at the surface. There's also a recess here. This is the end that goes down. There's about an inch and a half here so that the va flapper valve isn't, isn't getting banged itself. The pressure is taken off here. The sand just comes up, comes in, and then stays in. And you can actually get five or six feet of sand into a tube before the thing will jam up. Combining the Viber core as a drive force and the Baylor core as a sampling tool, we are able to drill to depths of 100 feet or more. The long black cable is a flex shaft which connects the Viber core head to the driving motor. The connection is a simple square rod which is held in place by a threaded fitting to the Viber core head. Once the shaft is tightened, then we're ready to start the motor and begin vibracoring. A five foot piece of drill pipe is used to start and properly seat the beginning of the hole. The vibracore goes in very easily at the start. Care must be taken to have the pipe remain vertical. To drill deeper, more pipe must be added, and the core head must be removed each time to allow this. The head is on exceedingly tight so that the drilling operation will not cause it to vibrate loose. Loosening would damage the threads of the drill pipe and possibly weaken them, causing failure down hole. The manufacturer of the drill pipe has put chrome on one end to alert the user not to use pipe wrenches on this portion. Pressure on these threads would cause binding and damage to the pipe. <laughs> 